information on Masonic etiquette. Meaning of Masonic etiquette Masonic etiquette is, by definition, something that is not to be left to an individual to see or to carry out according to his own taste. He conforms to it because it was formally adopted as a conventional requirement for acceptable behavior, whether he sees a good reason for doing so or not. An act of Masonic etiquette is some movement, action, courteous gesture or speech performed at a given time and place, in a certain manner, and according to rule, fixed and imposed by the fraternity itself. Since the rules are for the good of the craft as a whole, it affects each member. An organization such as ours adopts these rules because we need them to carry out our good works in an atmosphere of harmony. They are not empty and meaningless, arbitrarily enacted and imposed for the mere sake of performing them. The rules have been time-tested, and they work. Information on Masonic Etiquette If a master is in doubt about the correct form of etiquette for some particular occasion, he has several authoritative sources of information upon which to draw. He should consult the Manual of Lodge Programs and Protocol, the Mentor's Manual, the Officer's Manual, the Manual of Ceremonies, or the Constitutions of Masonry. He may confer with his older members, such as past masters, who usually have had experience of the kind needed on this occasion. He may consult with the Grand Provost, members of the Committee on Masonic Education, or District Educational Officers, D.E.O. They have broad personal experience, familiarity with and ready access to several books on Masonic etiquette. Sometimes these books may be too general in their treatment of certain topics and lack detailed explanations for specific application to a particular situation to be immediately useful. They are, nevertheless, valuable in providing general rules and principles which can be applied across the board. The O can usually be counted upon to help identify the appropriate source of authoritative rule. In addition, the perfect and suitable course of action. He could confer with the grand lecturer, division lecturer, or district instructor of work. Although most of forms of etiquette are not confined to ritual, yet they belong to the same general field of study, and most experienced ritualists are also usually very well informed on the rules and practical application of etiquette, protocol, and decorum. Aged and infirm. If a member is infirm, he should be assisted to enter the lodge and to salute on the arm of the junior deacon, and if he requires it, a special chair or special seat should be provided for him. However, it is not fitting or proper to attract undue attention to his infirmity by paying him special heed, remarking on his presence, etc. If an older member cannot attend lodge, some mention of him should be occasionally made at a communication and the master should see to it that he is visited and otherwise reminded that he is present in the minds of his brethren. A visitor should occasionally come to him as a lodge emissary, speaking officially in its behalf, not as a private friend only, and for that reason should act as he would act in lodge and in Masonic decorum. Altar In American jurisdictions, the altar stands at the center of the lodge room. It is a place of prayer, a pedestal that the great lights rest upon. The three lesser lights stand beside it. The obligation is taken in its presence. The worshipful master greets the candidate across it, and it is, in addition, a symbol and emblem of religion. Members and visitors stand before it to salute the East when entering or leaving the lodge. Masons when near it stand with dignity and act with reverence. It should not be draped or covered with flags bunting, banners, or draperies of any kind which carry the insignia of any association other than the lodge or grand lodge. It should be kept clean, its paint or varnish not marred, cracked or scratched. The top and kneeling pad, if upholstered, should never be allowed to become ragged, run down, or shabby. The ground between it and the east is a sacred precinct which is not crossed by officers or members during lodge communications except for the deacons and chaplain during certain ceremonies. Anteroom The anteroom is a part of the lodge room. It is not a separate place, therefore the decorum and etiquette of the lodge room governs it too. Since the tiler is in charge of it, he is responsible to the master to see that etiquette is observed. It should be clean and neat, with no litter lying about, the furniture in place, 
aprons correctly placed and stored, and nothing piled in it which does not belong there. Loud talking, joking, noise and needless moving about are considered inappropriate. The tiler should introduce himself to a visiting brother the moment he enters the anteroom, and should see to it that he has a seat, if he must wait before entering the lodge or while waiting for the examining committee. The door to the lodge room is in the junior deacon's custody, not the tiler's. The tiler should never open it or talk through it until after knocking. When a member enters lodge through the anteroom after the lodge is open, he is to observe a ceremony of entrance and this ceremony is initiated by the tiler according to a fixed process, and the method is never altered for any member or officer. Ballot The ballot is secret, sacred, and inviolate. When a ballot is taken the act is momentous for the candidate and significant for the lodge. It is an official act by each member in turn and by the lodge as a legal body. The ballot has legal sanction and must be conducted according to solemn rules. It is etiquette for the lodge room to be in complete silence, without whispering, or discussion of the candidate while waiting to cast your ballot or any information about how a member has voted. The officers should remain at their stations and places in silence and dignity. Such of them as participate in spreading, inspecting, and declaring it should act in strict decorum. The period of etiquette and decorum doesn't end when you've cast your vote. It includes the declaration of the results by the master, the restoration of the ballot box, and the return of the participating officers to their places. Decorum It is difficult to establish a hard and fast line between etiquette and decorum. Both deal with propriety and good behavior. However, there is a sharp contrast between the focus and principles of the two. In etiquette a mason is controlled by rules of manner and behavior at certain times and places in which he has no voice because they are governed by Masonic law and usage. The principle of decorum stands at the opposite pole, for it includes manner and behavior in the lodge room and our personal lives, as it is in each of us to decide and control. The essence of it lies in a mason, when present in lodge, not attracting undue attention to himself and not creating a disturbance. Thus. It is etiquette to speak kindly to and about each other, and while that is an act of good manners, it is one required by the rules of the fraternity. It is decorum not to whisper or in any way disturb your neighbor during the conduct of business. That is good manners as required by a man's own sense of good taste and dignity. If he talks aloud, disturbing the lodge, he does it, and it is therefore for him not to. He must decide his own decorum in the same way that the craft decides his etiquette. There are points at which the two converge, such as when the master must act to restore order and dignified behavior. He should reprove all disturbances quietly, promptly, without personal feeling, and attracting as little attention to the matter as possible. A glance of the eye or a soft tap of the gavel's handle is most often sufficient for the purpose. District Deputy Grand Master a district deputy on an official visit is received with an etiquette which reflects the fact that he is the personal representative of the Grand Master. When he is present in the lodge room it is as if the Grand Master was there in person. When he enters the anteroom he announces his presence to the tiler. The DDGM is not required to announce a visit in advance. It is a good practice, however. A committee is formed to escort him into the lodge. He is presented at the altar and conducted to the east, grand honors are rendered, after which he receives the gavel. The lodge is symbolically in his charge, until he returns the gavel and directs the master to continue with his work. A. He is never permitted to seat himself on the sidelines, unless it is at his own, specific, request. B. A master cannot fail in his practice of protocol if at all times he extends to the district deputy the ceremonial forms that are established as proper and correct in his official dealings with the grand master. C. Proper deference to the DDGM includes allowing him the protocol of final comment. No one should rise to speak on any issue after the DDGM has completed his prepared remarks. Worshipful masters are reminded to encourage their members to make announcements from the sidelines before the DDGM speaks. Distinguished Visitors If a visiting brother unexpectedly arrives who, because of his title or standing in the craft or some similar reason, 
is one that the master desires to introduce to the lodge, he may follow any of the following procedures. A. Have him presented at the altar by a committee of his peers, ceremoniously conducted to the east and saluted. You may request that he be seated in the east. B. Instruct the senior deacon to conduct the visitor to the altar and introduce him there, if he isn't a past master, after which he may be conducted to the east or back to his seat. C. Ask him to rise at his seat and introduce him to the craft there, if he feels more comfortable that way. Please remember that the master must stand and remain standing until the completion of this ceremony if the brother is a past master or holds title or office in a grand lodge. A. He is never permitted to seat himself on the sidelines, unless it is at his own, specific, request. B. A master cannot fail in his practice of protocol if at all times he extends to the district deputy the ceremonial forms that are established as proper and correct in his official dealings with the Grand Master. C. Proper deference to the DDGM includes allowing him the protocol of final comment. No one should rise to speak on any issue after the DDGM has completed his prepared remarks. Worshipful masters are reminded to encourage their members to make announcements from the sidelines before the DDGM speaks. Distinguished Visitors If a visiting brother unexpectedly arrives who, because of his title or standing in the craft or some similar reason, is one that the master desires to introduce to the lodge, he may follow any of the following procedures. A. Have him presented at the altar by a committee of his peers ceremoniously conducted to the east and saluted. You may request that he be seated in the east. b. Instruct the senior deacon to conduct the visitor to the altar and introduce him there, if he isn't a past master, after which he may be conducted to the east or back to his seat. c. Ask him to rise at his seat and introduce him to the craft there, if he feels more comfortable that way. Please remember that the master must stand and remain standing until the completion of this ceremony if the brother is a past master or holds title or office in a grand lodge. In the mentor's manual, MWA D. A. Smith, Jr. wrote that it is not proper to call upon the senior deacon to present guests who are masters or past masters, though some have confused one of the duties assigned to the senior deacon as being connected with the introduction of distinguished guests. Entrance during meetings. No member of the lodge or visiting brother should enter from the preparation room. When entering from the ante room after lodge is open, he waits until signaled by the tiler, steps through the door, and advances to the altar in due form. The worshipful master acknowledges the salute either sitting or standing. It is a ceremonious action on the side of both the lodge and the brother, and protocol requires that it be correctly performed. If a brother ignores the formality or is unfamiliar with it, the senior warden may whisper instructions in his ear for him to follow. Etiquette regarding officers An office has a station or place of its own in the lodge, with duties, responsibilities, and dignities inherent in it. The etiquette and protocol accorded to an officer represent the properties of the office and is not directed to the officer personally. A sloppy manner of saluting of approaching the east, or any other station, of standing, and of speaking to an officer, is a reflection on the lodge for a failure to give to the office that respect which belongs to it. If a master exacts of every member, and of every other officer, a faithful rendering of the form of etiquette that is to be accorded to his own office, it will create a more faithful observance of the form at every other station or place. Examination of Visitors The substance of an examination is fixed by the constitutions of masonry and our methodical digest. The manner in which it is to be conducted is the focus of etiquette and protocol. The examining committee withdraws with the visitor to a private place. They are in an official relationship with him and therefore their manners are formal. They must keep in mind that their only purpose is to satisfy themselves that the visitor is, or is not a master mason in good standing from a regular lodge under a grand jurisdiction with whom we are in amity. They are not called upon to test his proficiency in the ritual or to be personally inquisitive. If the examining committee has the right to satisfy itself that a visitor is a master mason in good standing in a regular lodge, the visitor also has a right to make sure that the lodge he comes to visit is itself a regular lodge. He may, 
therefore, ask to see its charter. But what if the lodge is already in session and the charter is hanging on the wall over the secretary's desk? It is etiquette to grant his request to see the charter. On the other hand, it is etiquette that we not disturb the lodge by going to fetch it. In such an impasse, dilemma, the etiquette of the lodge should take precedence. The visitor should be told in a friendly manner that if he wishes to examine the charter, he must come at another time and before lodge is opened. If the visitor satisfies the committee, and if the visitor himself is satisfied, the visitor as yet possesses no right to enter until after the worshipful master has consented. The committee should conduct the visitor to the anteroom and introduce him to the tiler who in turn ceremoniously hands him over to the junior deacon. Visiting is a privilege, not a right. To seek to visit a lodge is every master mason's right, and a master may for good reasons of his own refuse admittance to any visitor, except the DDGM and Grand Lodge officers. If the master does refuse, decorum requires that he call the senior deacon to his side and privately instruct him to go to the anteroom to instruct the tiler not to admit the visitor. A visitor may be refused admittance for reasons that do not reflect on him personally. Such an occasion might be when a particularly sensitive piece of lodge business is about to be conducted or if a reprimand is to be administered. Landmarks and Etiquette Before I'm taken to task by my brethren, let me state at the outset that I know the Grand Lodge of Virginia has not adopted and published any single list or set of rules that are labeled landmarks. To me, however, a landmark is some principle, law, or usage which belongs to Freemasonry, and as such if it were to cease, Freemasonry would cease with it. Therefore, the phrase observe the ancient landmarks is, to me, Another way of saying, do not act in such a way as to destroy Freemasonry. I believe that our landmarks are enumerated. They are to be found in the Book of Constitutions, adopted by Grand Lodge in the year 1791. These landmarks have a place in history. They focus on certain fundamental, ageless practices of ethical and moral behavior. There are some who say that Masonic etiquette, as a whole, is a basic principle and itself can be considered a landmark. If etiquette were to drop out of masonry, the craft as we know it would deteriorate, disintegrate, and in short order would cease to exist. Letters to Grand Lodge Officers Protocol dictates that any correspondence intended for the Grand Master, District Deputy Grand Master, Grand Secretary, other Grand Officers, or members of Grand Committees in their official capacities which call for an official reply, shall be addressed in full and correct form. Even if a grand officer or committeeman may be an intimate friend this rule is binding because, since the letter calls for official action, it may be referred to other grand officers, may go into an official file, or may even appear afterwards in printed records, in which event personal familiarity is out of place. It is also a courtesy to a grand officer to include in the letter the writer's lodge, its name and number, address, and also its district. Since there are many lodges in our jurisdiction, no grand officer can be expected to carry each and every one in his memory. The letter should state the writer's own position in the lodge, whether as a member, officer, past officer, or committeeman. To include such data in the correspondence may save the recipient the time and trouble to look it up. Also, and sometimes this point is important, makes a more prompt reply to your inquiry possible. In some instances, a letter addressed to the Grand Master or Grand Secretary may contain subject matter which will affect another Grand Officer or will be of special interest to him. In that event, a photocopy or clean carbon copy may be mailed to the latter. When this is done, the correct form is to append a postscript to the letter to that effect. In this form, a copy of this letter has been sent on this date to so-and-so. If a member of a lodge writes a letter in which the matter should, in courtesy, to be known by the worshipful master, a copy is mailed to him and the fact is noted in a postscript on the original letter. Non-Masons at Masonic Affairs On Masonic occasions where non-Masons are invited, there are three rules of etiquette and protocol to be applied. A. Non-Masons are not asked or expected to participate in any ceremonies or formalities which are themselves Masonic. B. The non-Masons are present as guests, the Masons are the hosts, 
the guest-host relationship is therefore observed. C. There are some usages of etiquette which belong to esoteric masonry and are never employed when non-masons are present. Other usages are not esoteric and as such may be employed as are appropriate, at the discretion of the worshipful master. The order of precedence protocol observed during Masonic processions, for example, are non-esoteric and may be used when non-masons are present and at a Masonic banquet when ladies are guests. Objections from the floor If a lodge member believes that he has good cause to object to something that is occurring, or believes that something said or done wrongs himself or another, or questions the appropriateness or legality of something said or done, there is a specific way that rules of Masonic etiquette and the practice of decorum would have him act. A. He rises and salutes the master. B. He waits until the master recognizes him. C. He states his objection, criticism, etc., in as few words as possible. D. He salutes and is seated. E. The master makes a reply or takes action. F. The proceedings are resumed. In any event, it is not for the member himself to decide or to take action, for that belongs to the master. He merely states his objection and does not elaborate or discuss it, unless requested to do so by the master. The member himself is finished with the episode when he has spoken and reseated himself. Past Grand Titles In American Grand Jurisdictions there are one or two common variants of the uses of each Masonic title. The correct form for a particular grand jurisdiction can be found in its proceedings, usually under the heading Roster of Officers. In the majority of grand jurisdictions, the titles run as follows. A. The Grand Master has the title of Most Worshipful. This is written or printed in full or may be abbreviated in the form MW. A Grand Master is not usually addressed Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of the State of ABC but as Grand Master of Masons I in the state of ABC. B. A past Grand Master has the same title. Care should be given to the form used during introductions. He can be introduced as past Grand Master of Masons in Virginia. But, if there are other past Grand Masters present, he should be addressed as Most Worshipful, full name, Grand Master of Masons in the year 19xx. Don't fall into the inadvertent trap of saying, M.W., full name, past Grand Master in the year 19xx. Why? Because that was the year he was our Grand Master. He didn't earn the status of past Grand Master until his successor was duly elected and installed. C. The same general principles apply when referring to or addressing our appointed district deputy Grand Masters. D. Every Mason carries the title brother. This title is employed in Lodge whenever a Mason is addressed or referred to. It is considered a major breach of good manners and propriety to address or refer to him as Mr. Blank or Blank. Past Masters In many societies, an officeholder reverts to the same status at the end of his term which belonged to him before. The rule in Masonry is different. A Lodge member who has held the highest office in the Lodge has for life a Masonic position of his own. It has its own identity and recognition and carries with it the title of past master. Past masters have a standing in Masonic law, certain duties may be assigned to them. In etiquette they are entitled to a deference which belongs to their position, in protocol, they are entitled to a certain order of precedence. On their own part, past masters are bound to the same rules of etiquette that is observed toward the worshipful master by all other members of the lodge. Preparation Room the preparation room is a sanctuary for the candidate and the officers preparing him. It is necessary that it be closed in and that its privacy is strictly preserved. It is a breach of good manners for the candidate to be under view or made the subject of unkind remarks. The officers preparing him act with dignity and are not expected to discuss with him anything in the degree he is being prepared for. It is proper to review any degrees that he has already taken and coach him to respond to questions in the same form and tense that they are asked. For example, is it, etc.? Answer it is, do you, etc.? Answer I do, instead of yes, sir and no, sir which in lodge sounds unsuitable. Quiet in lodge.
When during its proceedings a lodge is disturbed by any officers or members who are conversing, rattling papers, etc., the master gives a light tap of his gavel and asks for quiet. If the proceedings are necessarily brought to a standstill, until something necessary to the proceedings has been done, and the master sees that the wait will last for some period of time, he may tap his gavel and say, be at your ease. In that event, and no other case is private conversation, roving about, informal visiting, etc., within the bounds of propriety and decorum. Rebuke If it ever becomes necessary for a master to rebuke a member who has been unruly, he may do so after lodge is closed, in person, and in private. If it is required that a rebuke be administered while the lodge is in session, the method to be used is at the master's discretion, but, the etiquette required of him is that he shall deliver it in a friendly, even-handed manner. Decorum dictates that it shall be dispensed in a way that will not attract undue attention to the matter or create an additional disturbance. Ritual Etiquette The etiquette governing the conferral of degrees is strict. There shall be no talking, whispering, or laughing, or any disturbances during the degree work. It is not an occasion for mirth there should be no needless moving about. The officers participating shall never step out of their roles slash parts, to hold conversations, to make private comments, to indulge in pantomime, or to make remarks about the candidate. Nothing outside the standard work taught by the Grand Lodge Committee on work shall be substituted for any portion of it. If costumes are worn they must be correct and appropriate. Detailed arrangements are always completed before the degrees begin and not improvised while the degree is in progress. Speaker in the Lodge If a speaker comes a long distance and appears at the request of the lodge, the master should ensure that he is met at the airport, train, or bus, or at some specified time and place if he comes in his own car, that he is called for and conducted to the lodge, and that he is comfortably seated in the lodge. He should be introduced by the master and such information shall be given about him as will make the lodge to feel acquainted with him before he begins his address. The master, or some officer designated by him, should remain at his side after lodge is closed. He should be escorted to his hotel, train, or to his car if he came that way. If he has training aids or other baggage, he should be given assistance transporting them. At that or a subsequent meeting, the lodge should adopt a suitable resolution of thanks, a copy of which should be mailed to him by the secretary. Titles A master's title of worshipful master in his own lodge or in another lodge or jurisdiction is an official title, and wherever he goes it is entitled to recognition. If his own grand lodge is an annual communication his title gains him unchallenged admittance to the floor, if he visits another lodge, it receives deference due his rank. If a master is a member of a body in another right, the royal arch, consistory, etc., his title hasn't any legal lineal precedence, no such body has an office of worshipful master, but, should be extended as protocol, i.e., the ceremonial forms and courtesies that are established as proper and correct in official dealings. The converse is also true when the presiding officer of a body in another right visits a craft lodge or when he sits in it as a member. Although his title has no official standing, the application of Masonic protocol requires his correct title to be used, as a practice of good manners, when introductions are made. Unusual Lodge Circumstances An unprecedented situation may suddenly arise in any lodge. The master may be caught unprepared by a condition that he and the lodge had not encountered before, and not know of any preset rule to go by. In most instances, etiquette is not involved. In some, Etiquette is the substance of the matter. Let's suppose that you have a visitor from another grand jurisdiction, where lodge customs differ radically from our own, and the visitor does something or says something unexpected. In that event, the master does not first address himself to the visitor but to his members. He explains to them that the visitor is acting according to the rules or customs in fashion in his own jurisdiction. By indirection, he makes it clear to the visitor in what way he has acted uncommonly in this lodge. Note, if the visitor is not at fault, we should not embarrass him. It is the aim of etiquette not to embarrass him. 
once in a while, a particularly sensitive, unprecedented condition may arise. In these cases, there is a general principle for the master to apply. He stops the proceedings where they are and addresses himself to the lodge. He may, a, ask them to be at ease for a short time and take the needed opportunity to quietly reflect on the situation. b, call a member to his side for private consultation. c, call off if more time is needed, or d, if appropriate, assign the problem to a committee for research and concrete recommendations. Only after he has sorted through all the facts, explores the possible solutions, and weighs them carefully to determine their long-term consequences, he will make and announce his decision. Visiting the sick. The expression of good Masonic etiquette is not limited to assemblies of the craft. Certain etiquette belongs to the individual Mason, for example, when a Mason visits a brother who is ill, or infirm, or for other reasons, is confined to his home. A. He will ask for permission in advance, in order to make sure of not arriving at an inconvenient time. B. Will present himself as coming from the lodge. C. Will begin by bringing greetings of the lodge, and D. Will adapt the length of his visit and nature of his talk to information received from the family. There need be no report made of the visit to the lodge unless the brother visited requests there be, or the visitor believes the lodge is entitled to news or may wish to tender some official act of courtesy. Worshipful Master and Etiquette The worshipful master is the officer whose first duty it is to see that nothing is ever allowed to harm the lodge which is entrusted to his care. For that reason he cannot tolerate a careless practice of etiquette. If, upon coming to the East, a master finds that indifference to, or a casual practice of etiquette has crept into the lodge he should find an early opportunity to address the subject with his officers and members. What is the place of Masonic etiquette in the craft? It has no special place. It has every special place. It is always ob served whenever or wherever Masons assemble, or speak, or act in the name of the craft. For that reason it is described as Masonic. If it belonged to the ritual of the degrees a master might conceive it to lie outside the span of his responsibility, and hold that it is only in the care of the Grand Lodge or Grand Officers, but it is in the ritual as elsewhere and in no sense peculiar to the ritual alone. The Grand Lecturer, the Grand Provost, and their committees may consult and advise concerning a Lodge's practice of etiquette, but they cannot interfere. The Worshipful Master has full responsibility for etiquette, as he has total charge of all things in the Lodge. And, like all leaders, the WM may delegate authority, but the responsibility resides with him alone. Our brother, Harry S. Truman, said it best, the buck stops here. The worshipful master is master of the lodge's etiquette in the same sense that he is master of the lodge. It is as much his duty to govern the lodge in etiquette as in its business, its balloting, its debate, its conferring of degrees. As we continue to improve ourselves in masonry, we are indeed improving life. We know from history that without ideals to guide us, the garden of a man's life will not grow into a place of beauty. Thank you for joining us today, share with fellow Masons to dive deep into the etiquettes of our noble fraternity. Subscribe to Masonic Audiobook Library.